Then people extend it out from the single particle Schrodinger equation, a density matrix approach or a multiple sequential scattering or a stochastic Schrodinger approach. From the other end, people started evaluating quantum Monte Carlo uh, expressions, which were computationally extremely expensive. And there is this Negev approach, non-equilibrium green function approach, which really bridges all of these connections except for the time-dependent statistical uh, evaluations. And what we worked on uh, in, in the NEMO effort were really this non-equilibrium green function mechanism, multiple sequential scattering, and a single particle Schrodinger approach, a stochastic Schrodinger approach, and also a density matrix approach. And we explored all of these to more or less a certain degree of detail. And as you probably know, we were fundamentally geared towards Negev. And we really demonstrated that Negev can solve these problems. So at the end, we didn't just um, connect to one experiment and said, okay, we can declare success. But with experimentalists, we designed devices that were in a controlled environment. And at the end, we were overlapping experiment and theory over devices that were quite different. So here's four devices grown on top of each other on a wafer, and they're all symmetric in this case. And we made the, the spacer layer in front of the RTD thicker and thicker, okay? And you see that these curves basically overlap, and that means forward and reverse bias were nicely symmetric. Those are the blue and the green lines, and the theory laid on top. If you make, we had another test sequence where we made the devices, um, the wells, thicker and thicker, okay? And in one of the four devices, we also made an asymmetric barrier. We made the barrier thicker. And you, over, you basically see that we're overlapping experiment and theory, and we're going quite uh, nicely quantitatively with experiment. And on the bottom right, you see even when the structure is asymmetric, we follow the peaks in, in different bias directions. Now, in the previous lectures, you've seen roughly the physical effects of what charging should do, how it should move the peaks, but we never talked quantitative agreement. So at the end, in 1998, we really had designed a user-friendly quantum device design tool <coughs> that was about 50,000 person hours spent on this code, 250,000 lines of C and Fortran code. Um, that, was, that went on at JPL. We also developed NEMO 3D there. And really at the, the first target of NEMO was the transport through resonant tunneling diodes. The second target was in NEMO 3D, electronic structure and realistic large devices. The third target was qubit device simulation. And ultimately, uh, we're pushing now that this can also be an educational tool where you can really study heterostructures, band structure, and transport. And what NEMO 1D really did is it really bridged the gap between device engineering and quantum physics. Because you really have to understand the quantum mechanics under the hood, yet it was also coupled to real devices. And it was also an establishment that the negative approach can be an industrial strength tool and an engine that can really solve problems. It's not just an academic exercise, of, of doing something interesting in physics, but it can be a real design tool. That is very different in approach and theory than the normal drift diffusion approach that you find in commercial simulators. So this code was the first NEGAF code that actually was uh, doing this. And uh, it's right now only a few government labs and a few universities are using it due to some silly rules that have been imposed um, after TI sold um, uh, its business units to uh, Raytheon. Uh, on this chart on the right bottom, you sort of see sort of a bubble chart of what's all involved. So on the core, you have the negative formalism with boundary conditions. And then you plug in very nicely physical effects like phonons, dopants, alloy disorder, interface roughness, band structure, and charging. But you really only make this work in terms of a user and in terms of real uh, usage 
that if you do some software engineering where you have object-oriented principles, you have a documentation tool, a material da parameter database, a graphical user interface, a batch run interface, a library of examples, a hybrid C, Fortran, and Fortran 90 code, a novel software gener uh, grid generator, and a resonance finder. Those are all technologies that were developed alongside to make this a software package. And on those, I'll have a lecture as well on the software ex aspects of this tool. So that's part of this lecture sequence. So in 1998, I'm going to give you the bottom lines of what we've learned. That scattering, which was considered the source of valley current, is only important at low temperatures if you're just looking at scattering inside the central RTD. I haven't given you the reasons yet, so I'm just going to give you the bo bottom line for now. It is not important, generally speaking, at room temperature for high performance devices inside the RTD. But it is incredibly important outside of the RTD, in the emitter, in the extended device regions. That's where scattering is critically important, and those scattering uh, dominated states tell you about the injection of carriers inside of the RTD. And if you leave scattering out, if you do not include scattering on the outside of the RTD, you're not going to do well in the device simulation. Charge self-consistency. It's critical everywhere in the contacts and in the central device region. So a Mickey Mouse device, in terms of contact and just modeling the central unit, will not give you anything quantitative. You are living in a widely connected world where the device is connected to contacts, and if you leave those out, you cannot model the device. Band structure, this is what we're going to focus on in the next few lectures, is the critical element to really get valley current right. So for high temperature, high performance devices, which is what we're interested in, like room temperature, not physicist devices that operate at 4 Kelvin, but room temperature devices that carry a lot of current, that's where band structure, atomistic tight binding based band structure is really critical. Also the insight was that NEGAF can be a baseline of an industrial strength simulator. And it was made available to a couple of universities and it's being used in government labs. And it really was a experimentally verified analysis and design tool. So that's sort of the bottom line of the state of the art five years later after the NEMO project had started. So releasing NEMO 1D has been a real pain. Um, it is only right now available for, through JPL for government uh, use in the US. It's been so painful there was even a movie made about this. Um, and um, uh, what this really showed me as a, like my personal insight, really, we need to make these kind of codes available as public domain codes where we can share that rather than hiding it behind a big wall. Because there's a lot of technology in there that you really do not want to recreate all the time and they're not extremely well documented in scientific publications either. We're not doing very well with publishing these kind of details. The code itself is, should be a publication. And uh, so the um, NEMO 3D can be found. It's now on the NanoHub uh, website. If you're interested in the electronic structure part, not the transport part, NEMO 3D, uh, that's there. And the other NEMO can also be found. Uh, it's right here. So with that, I think I'll, I'll take some questions. Okay, I mean this is just sort of a broad overview of <clears throat> where did Nemo come from? What is it going to? What are the key answers you're going to learn basically today on on carrier transport in 1D? Okay.